The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, COP26, what can the art world do about climate breakdown? Plus, art storage, a spectacle in the depot in Rotterdam, and we look up close at Fragonard's The Swing. As talks continue at COP26, the UN's climate change conference in Glasgow, I talked to Lucia Pietrowisti of the Serpentine Galleries about climate justice and how the art world can go beyond sustainability to thriveability. As the depot, the Boyman's Van Berningen Museum, shiny new outpost opens to the public, I talked to Sherelle X and Sandra Kisters about the building they're calling the world's first publicly accessible art storage facility. And after it's undergone some conservation treatment, Jean-Honoré Fragonard's The Swing goes back on display at the Wallace Collection. And I talk to Eurico Jackal, the curator of French paintings at the Wallace, and Martin Wilde, who's conserved the work, about the French Rococo artist's most famous painting. Before all that, a reminder that you can sign up to the Art Newspaper's free daily newsletter for all the latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top left of the page. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. And if you like what we do, please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, world leaders have now left COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, and left negotiators to thrash out the finer points of an epochal agreement on the climate emergency. We heard a few weeks ago on this podcast about the Gallery Climate Coalition, a group centred on the commercial sector. But what can the wider art and museum worlds do to further their commitment to sustainability and beyond that to climate positive action? Lucia Pietroisti is the Serpentine Gallery's Curator of General Ecology, one of the first curatorial positions focused on the climate emergency. I spoke to her about COP26 and how culture can contribute to reversing climate breakdown. Lucia, tell me what you think about what you've heard from COP26 so far. I think what we could have expected in advance of COP26 actually opening has manifested. That is to say, for the most part, a much performative <laughs> a meeting of partial commitments and uh, some really big blind spots, I would say. Yeah, that was my impression too. I mean, the, the, the sort of headline blind spot that I thought was India not committing to net zero till 2070. But were there other particular concerns of yours? One of the things that we've been sort of looking into uh, with programming over the last few weeks and months has been the sort of uh, non-centering of issues around climate justice and repair, loss and damage and reparation in the COP26 discourse. It's also just worth mentioning that countries that present themselves as, and this is, you know, I'm learning this, I'm not a source of knowledge about this, I'm quoting actually uh, people much more learned than me, but it is remarkable to notice that at the same time as countries such as the UK present themselves as being sort of beacons in the sort of path to net zero, we see examples of those very same governments and very same countries making pledges and fundings of uh, some of the worst offenders in, in uh, fossil fuel uh, companies and so on just a few months before this. So I think it's very important to, you know, whilst ha maintaining a certain degree of optimism and really thinking how we can uh, sort of use the occasion of something like COP26 to uh, bring forth some optimisms and practical agendas. I, th I think at the same time, it's absolutely crucial to realize where COP26 is a performative project and to really dig deep into the places in which those very same commitments are not being fulfilled as they are being spoken. I wanted to talk to you about something you said there because it's climate justice and this is really crucial isn't it because climate change doesn't exist in a vacuum separate from other geopolitical issues and that's central to what you're doing in terms of general ecology at the Serpentine right? So the work around climate justice that we've been doing recently is definitely not uh, held by the General Ecology Project alone. It's a bringing together of the work of several different uh, uh, strands of very long-term research, namely the civic team uh, led by Amal Khalaf at the Serpentine uh, Galleries, which has been working on uh, issues around social justice for an incredibly long time. General Ecology, which up to 
quite recently probably itself had quite substantial blind spots in terms of realizing how uh, issues of environmental breakdown and environmental sort of risk rest on top of existing power structures uh, inherited from I mean, mainly colonization, extraction and empire. So it itself had to go through this process of learning and it did so through what I think you're referring to, which is the most recent program that we've just held at Dartington Trust in Devon, which looked at the intersections of race and ecology and issues of climate justice as they manifest on an actual piece of land, Devon, which is implicated in the history uh, of empire in quite substantial ways. And so uh, the, the let's say, the pool of knowledge that allowed for that discourse to sort of really be brought forth was within that pool of knowledge, I feel like I was more of a learner <laughs> and a supporter than really. So I've cited Amal Khalaf, the other co-curator and really initiator of this project is Ashish Ghadi Ali, who is a curator at Dartington, but mainly a filmmaker and an activist and activist in residence at UCL. And it was that bringing together that sort of ongoing conversation that led us to the event that just finished called Sensing the Planet, which saw itself as a little bit of a kind of pre-response to what we knew would be missing in the COP26 conversation. So at Sensing the Planet, this event that you're talking about, a kind of symposium, but also, is it right, there was, you know, artworks being performed, for instance, so it was, it was, it was about thinking through things, but also seeing art's potential as a form of activism and a form of kind of advocacy in terms of climate justice um, and the climate emergency. Absolutely. Really thinking about culture as one of the places in which you know, forms of politics and healing and reparations can also play out. And if we think about that performative thing that I was mentioning to you before, like is COP26 a performative exercise for the UK to pretend that it's not at the same time doing these other things against planet and people, then COP26 itself is to a certain extent a cultural project, right? So what cultural projects do we then place next to this very powerful cultural project that we're kind of in the middle of? And how do we start to think about art? I mean, I, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, that as, as far as I can tell, art and culture are the holders of a deep time learned memory that the human species sort of accumulates and passes on across deep time about our relationship and obligation to each other and to a more than human world and to the planet and so on. We encode it in myth, in memory, in dream, in art in music and storytelling and so on, we encode it in culture. And so if that's true retrospectively in terms of learning, that's also true sort of as we move ourselves towards the future, what do we encode? What futures do we kind of instantiate and start to world as we build and create culture? And that was kind of one of the ideas behind, you'd have to speak to the other two curators, sort of, they'd, they'd have a very different perspective, but that was one of the ideas that was very strong for me behind bringing together kind of activists and artists and practitioners of various kinds. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the role of the general ecology within the serpentine, but mm -hmm. as a sort of roadmap for a kind of um, environmental positioning from an institution, because of course, one of the things that we've learned, and we've talked about a lot even on this podcast, is that the historic kind of structures of arts institutions, cultural institutions, are fundamentally problematic in terms of their attitude to the environment and sustainability, for instance. There's a lot of waste. So can you say something about, about how the role of general ecology at the Serpentine has worked? So general ecology was developed as a bit of a prototype or an experiment a few years ago, 2018, uh, as an experiment to try and figure out and I don't know how conscious the project was of all of this at the time. I'm, you know, obviously speaking from this uh, lofty position of hindsight, but uh, it did know that it wanted to try and do something at systems level. And what I realized over the course of time is that any kind of organization or institution that speaks about sustainability and resilience in its, you know, business plan or mission statement might in fact be referring to its own sustainability and its own resilience above all. And so the question was, what kind of project can we generate? And what are the sort of points of agency that I might have finding myself in a curatorial position to try and pivot that sense of purpose of an art institution, not in such a way that it abandons its mission of presenting art to an audience, but so that it might incorporate within that mission a notion that dedicating oneself to sort of planetary justice and balance, environmental justice and balance, might in fact 
bring a different kind of sustainability and resilience of the organization, a different kind of thriving. And so the way that it went about it was to really start from programming some quite seductive and exciting public programs that addressed environmental questions. The first one, which I worked on with Filipe Ramos, is an ongoing series called The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish. And it sort of spoke about interspecies communication and consciousness across species. I mean, what's more fascinating than that? You know, it's really seductive subject matter. But what happens over the course of uh, the repetition of that set of projects and many others that emerged between, between then and now is the building of a community of audience and a network of partner organizations that aren't all art organizations. In fact, most of them were not. And so by the, by the time you get to a certain point in the history of the General Ecology Project, what you've noticed is that the audience and your network is mirroring back at you an image of yourself as an institution, as someone who has a stake, who has kind of engaged itself and committed itself to environmental justice and balance, for example. And so then at that point, you work with your colleagues. And I have to say that the Serpentine has been you know, phenomenal in doing this and that I'm telling you the story from one entry point, but these things were happening and emerging across the whole institution. It was just a question of tying them together. Then you have a conversation with all your colleagues across the different layers from buildings and plannings to energy, you know, to the directors, to the board, about how do we integrate all of these different possible efforts that we can commit to in a holistic way. And so general ecology didn't do all this by itself, but it was really kind of trying to think about the connections that might happen uh, across the whole institution. And so to give you uh, an example of a program and a project that emerged out of this moment of great kind of flourishing of environmental thinking, Back to Earth is a case in point as, an, uh, as a project that, uh, in a sense, celebrates the last 50 years of the Serpentine's activities, but celebrates it by asking ourselves, well, how can we take responsibility over the next 50 years instead? Um, invited 65 artists to propose an artwork that would be at the same time an environmental intervention or campaign. And then the Serpentine's role is to put itself around that and become adherent enough and transform itself as, a, as an organization in such a way that it can support those initiatives, right? Be they artworks in a traditional sense or more often than not, not. <laughs> <laughs> and so as we work towards Back to Earth becoming having a manifestation in exhibition form, which is by no means the only one uh, of the project. We've been working on this for two years and it looks as though it might last another 20. But as we are working towards the exhibition version, we're using that occasion to really prototype. We're ver working quite closely with Julie's Bicycle. We're using that occasion to try and prototype ways of making exhibitions where not only do we try and reduce our carbon footprint, but actually we try and place reparative and regenerative, almost like protocols into the fabric of the exhibition itself. I'm not sure I can be very specific about examples yet, but that's the work that we're doing at the moment. But that's crucial, isn't it? Because one of the things is that sustainability has become the buzzword, mm -hmm. but actually because of the, the damage, as you say, it's about repair and therefore sustainability sort of isn't enough, right? So it's, you've used this term thriveability to me mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about that? Because of course that means effectively having climate positive artworks, for instance, or projects or organisational frameworks, right? Yes, and that can be true uh, if we're thinking about carbon or, or pollution. So we can think about phytoremediation. I was just speaking with Himali Singh Soin about uh, her project Static Range, which is part of Back to Earth and it's there is an element of it which is the planting of a phytoremediation garden which is sort of designed to let's say process and purify and heal particular conditions of the land be they radioactivity or uh, other forms of pollution so we can think about that example we can also think about thriveability in the sense of a legacy that is for example focusing more on like social justice or forms of reparation. So there is an, an enormous amount of distance between kind of environmental thrivability and questions around repair and reparation and restitution and healing. We're sort of moving, there are vectors that move in the same direction, I, I would say. And I'm still working out what that really means. I mean, there is a big movement around regenerative agriculture, for example, or 
a similar thing is happening in advanced technologies. And I think we're all trying to work out what it means. I actually first came across this principle thrivability from a book uh, that my colleague Ben Vickers recommended to me uh, called How to Thrive in the Next Economy by John Thackeray. And he really did, does describe it as from do less harm to leave things better. Now, obviously, we need to be humble when we approach that, because how do we actually know that we're leaving things better and who are we leaving it better for? Those are questions that are really important to ask. But I'm really sort of drawn to this idea that being in the world and doing as little harm as possible might actually not be enough anymore. One of the things about obviously about institutions is they're made up of people and they're made up of networks. And of course, like the emblematic figure at the Serpentine to a certain degree is Hans Ulrich Obris. And Hans Ulrich Obris <laughs> is a famously peripatetic curator. He's traveled hugely. Is general ecology as specific as ensuring that Hans Ulrich transforms the way that he conducts his relationships across those networks? I would suggest that Hans Ulrich himself has made those commitments uh, in, in public, in fact, uh, several times, and that they are consistent with the projects that we're working on. I wouldn't say that it's General Ecology's mission. I wouldn't dare. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what I was interested in when Hans Ulrich sort of announced Back to Earth and spoke publicly about his own relationship with travel and so on, what I was interested in is what effect 20, whatever they might be, 10 airplane tickets less in the world a year. Not so much that effect, but the effect that occupying that position of cultural influence would have when making that statement on the rest of the cultural field. So if we think about it from in systemic terms, what does Hans Ulrich making that pledge actually, what can it achieve in terms of the ripples of that uh, outwards? That's more where I end up, you know, at this kind of like, strategy point my brain just gravitates to, to that I wanted to talk about sun and sea uh, because it's become a project which it gathered momentum at the Venice Biennale it won the golden lion and, and has now become this kind of force of climate awareness it's currently in Malmö I think in Sweden can you say something about how much of it was an intention as a kind of form of activism and how much of it was just an artwork about climate change that's a really interesting question. And I have to tell you that it's really interesting to exist with a work for so many years because it just keeps changing. So the work had been developed before it was presented at the Venice Biennale uh, by the three artists, Viva Granite, Rukile Barjukaite and Lina Lapelite, as a follow-up to a collaborative work that they had done uh, called Have a Good Day, which has supermarket checkout counter employees, all of them sort of women in their middle age, uh, in a row, singing an opera, which has their daily musings and kind of just streams of consciousness. And the whole opera is in some way commenting on consumption. So it goes without saying that whilst the artists have tended to be quite shy about coming out directly with their political commitments, their collaborative work has emerged things that could be interpreted or in some way operationalized in a political sense. And Sun and Sea is no exception in as much as whilst the piece tries to be as quote unquote non-judgmental as possible, the very fact of lazy sunbathers worrying about quite meaningless things whilst noticing volcanic ash clouds and plastic bags in the sea and rubbish on the beach and and you know, and, there, and there's also larger themes emerging in the choirs like eutrophication and ocean acidification and uh, and and several others. So you do notice a cognitive dissonance between what these people are thinking about and what is actually going on. And I think that's where the drama and pathos uh, experienced by the audience sat, at least in Venice, in the self-recognition of our experience of life. And I really, really, really have always stressed, and I need to stress here, that that is a self-recognition on the part of a particular sort of slice of the world's population who is not at the forefront of climate breakdown yet, because let's be honest, that is just a question of time, and that therefore has a notional, instinctive, but not physical material right in uh, one's face relationship with climate breakdown. And I think that was something that sort of unconsciously existed in the unfolding of the piece over the years. Obviously, taking the piece across different parts of the world, it having gone through 
just like we all did, the COVID pandemic, the piece kind of gathers meaning, <laughs> sort of picks it up like it's a bit sticky somehow, picks up meaning wherever it goes. And one of the things that emerged even more strongly as it's been traveling this winter and doing the US tour has been that that thing, you know, this unequally distributed effects of climate change, who the people are on the beach, how they experience, how they encounter the weather, you know, is also exists within a language of empire, colonialism and white supremacy, that, that what we are looking at is a certain slice of the world, but also whiteness, sort of toxic whiteness, ignoring its own shit, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Its own, its own products, you know, its own sort of legacy. So that's something that the artists have been interested in receiving as a kind of feedback. I cannot say that it was in the original intention of the piece, but it's interesting how pieces, yeah, they sort of, they're also antennae. They put something out and re they receive something in. And what I'm doing with you now is sort of sensing into all these things, all these little words that come and, you know, I occupy a specific position in relation to the piece, but I, I hear all these things and I'm like, oh, how can I make sense of, of how this how this is? So we'll see. We'll see what it gathers next. <laughs> right, exactly. One of the things I'm conscious of, particularly in the context of you talking about the performative nature of, of political leaders talking about climate change in Glasgow, is about the performative nature of the way institutions, particularly I'm thinking about what's, what's going on at the Science Museum at the moment, the way that institutions talk about climate change. So one of the key factors that's emerged from the trustees resigning from the, from the Science Museum mm -hmm. is that um, Hannah Fry verbalised this idea that the institutions were not listening to young people enough. And one of the things I'm conscious of is that there is a disconnect often between the inst people who run institutions and their audiences, and particularly their audiences of the future. And I wonder if, do, do you have any optimism that actually the, the, the activism, that just the sheer pressure of what's going on right now can actually set that on the right course? Because I, I'm not terribly optimistic that, that, that our institutions, certainly in Britain, are really taking all the steps they need to in terms of climate justice, climate repair, etc., Slightly laughing to myself because I'm realizing that a lot of the times I, that I end up on sort of panels and in conversations, I end up on the kind of like break down the institution camp, <laughs> uh, you know, like the institutional critique, everything is institutions are dead and all of that. And the reality of the matter is that I, I'm probably not as radical <laughs> as that, <laughs> though I may want to be, but I have a firm belief in what organizations and institutions can birth having experienced myself the space for the general ecology project to bloom for example what i what i've noticed and something that has really been kind of bothering me is the sense of crisis and loss of purpose and if we think about institutions as people individual people but also kind of as one person like they get depressed and have this feeling of paranoia, you know, that crit criticism is coming from all over the place. So what we need to formulate is sort of better statements rather than actually think about transformation internally. So there's like paranoia and depression, you know, like what, what's the point? These crises are right in front of us. Like, what's the point? What are we doing? And I think in that context, it's really important to recover a sense of possibility and a willingness to be open and transform and and a sense of optimism, and really this question of sense of purpose. And once you do that, then there's a generosity that unfolds that I think will change very substantially. And I think it's happening. You know, I think generations of institutional practitioners that have a lot more been trained on histories of collaboration and interdisciplinarity and so on are, you know, really coming into these, these spaces as well. So I think that's happening. There's a lot of work to be done, like masses of work to be done, but I remain a sort of somewhat institutionalized optimist, I'm afraid. <laughs> Lucia, thank you so much for talking to us. Ben, a joy. Thank you so much.
You can read more about general ecology at serpentinegalleries.org and Sun and Sea is at the Malmö Konsthal until the 14th of November and then at the New European Theatre Festival in Moscow from the 19th to the 21st of November. It comes to London next year. For more on COP26 and the art world, visit theartnewspaper.com or our apps for iOS and Android, which you can get from the App Store or Google Play. And we've explored the climate emergency on this podcast on many previous episodes, as well as the recent conversation about the Gallery Climate Coalition. This year, we've also discussed climate change's effect on Venice. We explored the ongoing problems with fossil fuel sponsors at the Science Museum in London, which prompted two more resignations in the last week. And we talked to the artist Richard Moss about deforestation in the Amazon and rainforest. You can find all of these episodes wherever you're listening now. Coming up, we talk about the Depot, the spectacular new art storage museum in Rotterdam, and about Fragonard's The Swing. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. Archaeologists excavating at Saqqara, an ancient necropolis just south of Cairo in Egypt, have unearthed the tomb of a royal treasurer from the time of King Ramesses II, who reigned from around 1279 to 1212 BCE. The tomb walls bear painted scenes of men bringing animals as offerings for the deceased, the slaughter of animals and carvings of the tomb owner himself, a man named Tehemwia. As Gary Shaw reports, the archaeological team from Cairo University report that the tomb's design is similar to an ancient temple, but so far only the entrance area has been excavated. Hieroglyphic inscriptions relate that, in addition to being a royal treasurer, to him we are served as a royal scribe, a supervisor of cattle, and was responsible for the divine offerings at a temple of Ramesses II in Thebes, or modern Luxor. Women account for just 16% of the NFT art market, according to a report published by the research firm Art Tactic this week, which based its findings on primary and secondary market sales on Nifty Gateway over the past 21 months. As Annie Shaw reports, the analysis hardly comes as a surprise. Despite the metaverse being touted as an inclusive and diverse space, the NFT market's been dominated by the likes of the US artist Beeple, Pac and Canadian-born Mad Dog Jones. While Pac's nationality, gender and age remain undisclosed, the only known woman to make it into the top 10 NFT artists is the musician Grimes, whose sales total $8.9 million to date, compared with Beeple's $50.8 million. And finally, a dream project envisioned by Diego Rivera around eight decades ago was unveiled this week at the Anahuacali Museum in Coyoacán, a sprawling museum on the outskirts of downtown Mexico City, devoted to housing Rivera's vast collection of pre-Hispanic artworks. As Gabriela Angeletti reports, the so-called City of Arts project comprises a 13-building complex that flanks the main Anahuacali building, adding 6,000 square metres of gardens and exhibition, workshop and performance spaces. Rivera bought the 40,000 square metre property that houses the museum in 1941 with Frida Kahlo. He later began construction on a building that resembles a Mesoamerican pyramid, which served as his workshop and became the home of his 60,000-piece pre-Hispanic art collection. You can read these stories and much more on the website or our apps. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Mark your calendar for the auction event of the season as Christie's New York hosts the 20th, 21st century art sale series beginning on the 9th of November. Engage in a nuanced narrative where Caillebotte, Monet, Picasso and Van Gogh meet iconic playmakers Warhol, Basquiat, Rocher and Banksy. Experience one of the greatest American collections ever to come to market with the Cox Collection and transition to the dynamic world of digital art and NFTs with Beeple's first physical evolving sculpture, Human One. Find out more at Christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, the Depot Boymans van Berningen in Rotterdam is being called the world's first publicly accessible art storage facility. The Depot is housed in a dramatic mirrored building next to the Museum Boymans van Berningen in the Museum Park in the Dutch city and includes more than 150,000 objects housed together in 14 storage compartments with five distinct climates for different types of object. Visitors can simply turn up and experience the depot or book guided tours to see the different compartments in depth. It's the first of a number of open storage museums to open over the coming years, among them the V&A East's Collections and Research Centre in London. I spoke to the Boymans Van Berningen's director, Cheryl X, and to Sandra Kisters, the head of collections and research at the museum, as the depot prepared for its public opening on Saturday the 6th of November. Sherelle, I'd like to start with you. What was the impetus for the creation of the depot? One of the most straight things 
was that the depots that were down in the minus one level of the museum were not really fit against the rising water level. And that was an enormous threat to the museum and to the collection. And it caused a kind of creative process to find a solution and maybe also a new typology for a depot. And then, of course, we started to think about this. And um, the most wonderful solution would have been, and that's what we now do, that it could bring us a new depot very close to the museum, so right in the city center. And my longer dream was a depot could also be accessible to audience. You said it was a longer dream, but how early was the idea of it being something that people could visit built into the designs and the process? It, it started, in fact, when I visited the first museums like John Soane's, and uh, then I saw many times the depots that I was responsible for as a director in Utrecht and later in Rotterdam. And even the, the single moments that you could give a guided tour in a depot, so many things happened, uh, like walking through a library where you were looking for that specific book and finding three others or nine others. And uh, I thought this is a form that we lost in a certain way. Though if you go to the uh, traditional print rooms, uh, the Kupferstich Kabinette, it's still possible to, to end there with a Michelangelo in your arms yeah? or in front of you. So in fact, it's a form that is very close to us and has been in the tradition of the development of the museum typology. Sandra, can you say something about the nature of the collection at the Boymans Museum? Because it's, it's a very diverse collection, isn't it? Yes, it's a very diverse collection. Uh, it, it ranges in time from, say, 1400 uh, up until the present, uh, varying from uh, old master paintings and drawings to uh, contemporary art, modern art installations, but also a very big collection of applied arts, photography, film. So we always describe it as sort of a, a diversity um, of all kinds of, of objects. So it's it's so diverse that we always try to cross boundaries between disciplines and find new interpretations. And just building on what Cheryl said about this idea of the kind of that kind of experience of entering into a space where you have the the freedom to access those kind of materials like in a library of course it's it's more difficult when you have complex works of video installation or sculpture and stuff like that how can you make those kind of things accessible to the public we took that quite literally so uh for instance our film and video collection which isn't a very large collection it's it's approximately 250 works and some of them are part of modern art installations but uh, in the process, we digitized the whole collection. So in the depot, there are now two study cabins where you can also study the film and video collection. So in one depot, you will see the carriers. So you see the film cans or the videotapes or all other kinds of carriers. Uh, but you can also study them. And we emphasize that it's study because it's, of course, not the way we would show them in an exhibition. Yeah, and, and don't forget about the movie theater that we have also as a service for the audience now in our premises. Oh, how lovely. That's one of the things that I'm really interested in with this, because one of the things about the depot is that it's obviously from the outside, it's deeply spectacular. It's something which is an, an, a sort of destination looking building. And on the other hand, it also serves a very practical role. So Sandra, can you say something about how you balance those kind of considerations? Because you've got to look after the collection as well as make it accessible, right? Yes, well, in the first place, it's, of course, a, a, a very new high-end building with excellent facilities for storage, for conservation. Uh, I've, I've never had these beautiful conservation studios as we have now, so I'm very, very pleased. And it's, of course, very nice to um, invite the audience in, in the storerooms. But, of course, it's also challenging because we take care of the collection, so we had a lot of discussions about how to do this in a safe way but still inviting people in. So, for example, if we give guided tours in the depot, when people enter the actual storerooms, they are accompanied by uh, a guide and a guard, and they wear special coats so that they feel that they enter these storage rooms. And I think we've managed to do it in a very safe way, but also inviting people in. And uh, what is quite wonderful, too, is that this new tool or this new instrument 
is so helpful in our own job too. You were talking about this encyclopedic collection. I think you could compare the collection of the Ashmolean with uh, the Boymans, and then we have many things more, and they also have many things more that we did not collect. But if you look into the specialists and into the agendas of the curators, now for the first time, we have a kind of access ourselves uh, to the collections that we are so fond of. So if you try to relate these collections or find analogies or associations, it never has been so easy to do it. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, one of the things I was I was struck by when reading the material around the depot is that you sort of curated where the objects are so that there is a coherent vision, right? So that, in other words, you haven't got a surrealist work next to a Renaissance painting, for instance. You have actually clusters of surrealist paintings together. Is that right, Sandra? Well, that's the only cluster we made, actually. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I must. Uh, I must confess that in the painting storeroom, which is a, a beautiful half round shape of the building, we did do a chronological order slightly. Uh, also from a practical side, because curators of old master paintings then can overview their collection part and uh, when they're researching it. But most storerooms are organized on material, on size on uh, fragility. So uh, in the photography uh, storeroom or in, for instance, the metal storeroom, all periods and times and techniques are mixed. But yeah, the surrealists are all together. <laughs> That's really nice. Uh, Cheryl, I mean, one of the things that I'm conscious of is, that, of course, in a normal museum setup, to a certain extent, the taste of the viewer is curated by the curators. So the curator will, will dictate what you can discover. But this offers a completely different way of discovering art, doesn't it? There are going to be moments where the public will see an artist's work that the curators may not feel is important, but they will then form a relationship with. Exactly. And that's already happening. So it's happening within the depots that the curators know best. Uh, and the curators do discoveries themselves too because what you see in a computer is completely different than what you see in reality but when you look at the real thing we look very much forward also to the response of the audience I'll give you a very strange example we unfortunately had to abandon the museum eh, because of all these problems with the building it will be fixed within a couple of years one of the latest mounted collection exhibitions was showing works from the 1300s to the 21st century. We had 60 rooms and we really unpacked, that was great. And at a certain moment, uh, one of the visitors approached me and said, well, Mr. X, did you notice that one entire century is not there? And I said, no, I'm sorry, what? Did we forget about a century? <laughs> it was the 18th century. So. You know, the Dutch had quite a nice 17th century. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so we say this proud and loud. The 19th century was quite interesting too, uh, not in the least because London and Paris and Berlin were very exciting, and Rotterdam is in the middle. But there was no work at all in the 3,000 works that were selected from the 18th century. I mean, whose problem is that? <laughs> right. And we have them in lots. Ah, that's really fascinating. Um, let's talk about the the um, experience then of because there are different kinds of visit, right? So you you can you can go in and just enter the building, and there's this extraordinary atrium, and you can walk around and see things behind windows and all that kind of thing. Um, but then there's also this guided tour, which, which it seems to me is the one that most people will be really wanting to experience, where you can actually be taken into those storage areas and shown the racks, etc. Tell me about that, Sandra. Can you want to sort of take us through that kind of itinerary? Well, the first responses we're getting now of the first people we've invited in in the last two days, uh, you know, going up to the, the big opening in uh, this Friday and for Saturday to the public, is that people are in this atrium amazed by, you know, the diversity and the range of the collection because it's displayed in these huge glass uh, display cases designed by Marike van Diemen together with uh, architect MV RDV. Then you see inside the storeroom, so you already can see a lot, and our education department gave a lot of information through a depot app and through touch screens uh, for which you can also look into the room. So even if you do not take a tour, you can get a lot of information. And people are already saying that they can't 
take it in all at once that they have to come back because there's so much to see. Um, but if you go on a tour, then um, you may visit a storeroom, but you could also visit the climate rooms, the mounting studio, the photo studio, so all the behind the scenes spaces. And then the idea is that we or my, my department people are just working. If we are doing something in a storeroom and a guided tour enters, they just enter and take the tour, give information about what we are doing. Uh, people are not interrupted. They're just continuing their work. But you see us at work where we are. And then they take you through the, through the building and really show you the behind the scenes uh, story. And even objects that are in the depot app that you cannot see from the window you can encounter when you're in a guided tour because you see small uh, indications in the racks that there are these works and we will adding them later on maybe two important remarks only the guide is permitted to uh, pull the racks and there's a security guy in the group to keep that going that's an important one and if a person during making the reservation would ask for a special work whatever it is from your family's ownership in a heritage or just because you love the artist or most likely because you are the artist, <laughs> then of course you can be helped and there's a special room to see that work single or you can go with the tour that will go along that certain work. And so it's tailor-made. That's great. And then you say there that you can see behind the scenes activities, but obviously, you know, that you have to have the buy in from members of staff in order to do that. So because that, essentially they, they become a kind of performer. Right. So so tell me about that, Sanjay. There must be some people who are much more sort of wanting their work to be visible than others, I'd imagine. Well, we had a lot of discussion about it in the past, but the funny thing is that the more we experimented with it, uh, we already did so in the museum just to see how the audience would respond if you do a conservation project, but also a large reassessment of our lace collection, which we did in the museum, that you get a very nice dialogue with the public. People asking questions, but also bringing information that we did not know before. We, we encountered a, a lace collector who knew much more about techniques of the 17th century than we did. So that was very interesting. And I noticed that, that the staff working now more in the public eye uh, is also proud of their work. And they like to tell about their work. They, they tell the, the, the guides. So we will give a lot of information, maybe not on the spot but we will give a lot of information in advance. And there also will be workshops or other moments that you can encounter someone to tell more about uh, their work. So I think overall that they're much more uh, positive about it than maybe eight years ago. And even something which is happening at the moment. So learning in practice is of course something you do in a museum too. Being a, a conservator is not just one step from uh, studying to uh, practicing, but we started a collaboration with two high schools in Rotterdam to invite young people to learn the beautiful professions that we have in the performing arts in the depot. And so we have object cleaners, we have people for security with a certain style. We have, of course, people who do uh, art handling. All these professions you can only do when you have practiced these in real. And this could even be something that is interesting to other museums because these people do not come from a school. They come from what they have learned from their predecessors. The depot, in a, in a way, is a kind of new model. There's the Schaulager in Basel, for instance, which has kind of storage facilities that are visible. But this is a, an entire public museum and therefore represents something of a new model for the way that museums can show their collections now. And, of course, we have the V&A East um, opening in the future in London and their collection centre. Are you in discussion with a, with a sort of global community of professionals around this, this territory? Because they must be following what you're doing with a tremendous amount of attention. No, of course, of course, we have visited many, many, many colleagues and a lot of people have visited us as well. Uh, we've been discussing with v &A a lot, actually. Schaulager, of course, is one of the earlier examples very nice example of opening up storage, but I think it's, it's, it differs in our case that the storerooms are a bit more hidden from view, that you really make an appointment to see a few of them. And since the collection is a lot smaller, there's a lot of space to unpack all the works. And we are more strict in, in the store as it is, 
I mean, if something is packed in a crate, it's packed in a crate with us. But of course, objects that we do not pack, like paintings or ceramics or glass, it's visible. So it's, it's sort of the approach to the concept differs. And I think V&A also chose to do a slightly different approach than we did. But we did have a lot of discussions about how we uh, developed our plans. And what you, what you forget about to talk is that we, early summer this year, we organized uh, a congress. It would have been live in Rotterdam. But due to Corona, we went on the Zoom. Uh, Sandra and I and, uh, and uh, a colleague who was a moderator uh, went to a small studio uh, nearby. And we talked uh, an afternoon with 200 colleagues all over the world who were online uh, with teams just because they were interested in in what our experience is and what mm -hmm. the goal is and what the plan is. So museums in Singapore, in China, in America, in Western Europe, everywhere were interested in the information that we can provide them with. So uh, people really listen. I think that in the professional world, this is a kind of new typology that is not an example, but it's people are following because it could be a next step for your museum too, or a good example to learn why you won't. Right, that's really interesting. <laughs> One of the <laughs> things that I'm curious about is you mentioned earlier on that it, that it's it's obviously that it's very very much opening up to the public, but it's also redefining the kind of professional relationship with a collection too, isn't it? So in the sense that your own academic research of your staff will shift as a result of this. So we we will improve our knowledge, and that comes from uh, uh, scientific work in sources and in archives, but also from scientific work through the microscope and uh, evaluating what we what we find in the works itself. So that is a great improvement. And I do hope as well that we can, in a general way, improve the knowledge about how to take care of, of heritage in general. And so if you speak to people in general, they do not know what sun does with a photo or what a, a piece of paper suffers uh, when there's too much lux eh? and people approach us and ask, why is the painting that my granddad gave me so brownish? And do you know how to, to fix it? And so it, I think it would be very good that we approach the art for what it is and for the great ideas and plans and energy that artworks have. But uh, the general knowledge about how to keep this also when it's your property in a good shape could be a lot better and could improve. And so that would be a wonderful thing to realize with such a new tool that we now opened. Well, Cheryl and Sandra, thank you both very much for talking to me about The Depot. You're welcome. You're welcome. The Depot Boymans Van Bernigen opens on the 6th of November and you can find out more and book tickets at boymans.nl. That's B-O-I-J-M-A-N-S dot N-L. Now it's time for the work of the week. The Swing by Jean-Honoré Fragonard is one of the most famous works of the 18th century. It's just undergone technical analysis for the first time alongside conservation treatment at its home, the Wallace Collection in London. And it's now back on display in a relit gallery alongside all the other Fragonard paintings in the museum. I spoke to Yuriko Jackal, the curator of French paintings at the Wallace, and Martin Wilde, who's conserved the work, about the process and what it's told us about this extraordinary painting. You can see an image of the work on our website, click on the podcast tab and look for this episode. Martin, I wanted to begin with you because you've been undertaking this work on this painting. Can you tell us what had happened to it over the years and what you had to undo, if you like? Well, over the years, it was varnished with a soft resin varnish, mastic or damar. A long time ago, we don't really know when, probably the 19th or early 20th century, a thick layer of varnish which had slowly gone yellow. And uh, this happens imperceptibly. You don't always realise what's happening. And in fact, it was quite hard to tell in the gallery uh, how yellow it was. Uh, it was only when we did a little test that we realised it really was a thick yellow varnish and there was quite a lot of paint texture underneath it, which you couldn't see. Um, and uh, so we decided to go ahead. That's great. And t can you tell us, I mean, there were retouches as well. It wasn't just varnished, is that right? Actually, there's very, very little wrong with it. There's a tiny bit of paint missing uh, quite near the bottom and a little bit along the bottom edge where it was cut off its original stretcher or strainer, probably in the mid-19th century. 
perhaps at the time it was acquired. We don't really know much about that either. Right. Yeah, but that's the curious thing, isn't it, Yuriko? Because because on, on the one hand, this is one of the most celebrated paintings, probably Fragonard's best known painting, and yet we have very little detail about, for instance, who even commissioned the work. That's true. It's one of the sort of great mysteries of the history of European art that we don't know who commissioned it, and we don't know where it initially hung. What we do know is that Fragonard was approached at some point in about 1767 by an unnamed gentleman of the court who asked him to take on a commission that another artist had already passed on because it was very scandalous in nature, requesting that Fragonard paint the patron's mistress on a swing, being pushed by a bishop, and putting the young woman in such a position so that the patron in the painting could see up her skirt. Indeed. Now, tell me, Martin, what has the restoration revealed in terms of iconography or anything like that? Has it revealed much more just about the way that it's painted, or is there anything that we can see now that we couldn't before? Uh, I think what you can see about the, the way it's painted is how incredibly thick some of it is and how very, very thin some of the rest of it is. The, uh, the leaves in the top left-hand corner are painted as thinly as a watercolour wash whereas the bottom of the tree trunk on the right and some of the flowers um, are very, very thick, very thickly impastoed, particularly the... We presume it's moss at the bottom of the tree trunk. It's really painted sort of like moss, almost as thick as a thin bit of moss. Indeed, and there's this sort of glorious light about the painting now, isn't there, Eureka? Absolutely. One of the things that cleaning has really woken up for us is the sense of distance, the way in which the painting unfolds into the into the background we have a much greater sense of perspective than before and we also have a sense of this dappled light that falls over the trees in this little glade that um, that this young woman is swinging in and just to sort of go off of what Martin said about um, all of the details that have really been unveiled before our eyes in this picture I think that that indicates the level of care that Fragonard put into planning this composition and into really perfecting it and achieving it in a way that we don't necessarily always see with him. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you say a bit more about that? Well, I think that it implies that this was a really important commission for him. And, of course, this was made at a point in his career when he was just starting to step away from the Royal Academy, where he had been trained and where he was really tipped to become the kind of future leader, um, you know, the next generation of history painters. And I think that this painting and this commission maybe represented a possibility for a break away from that. And it seems like something that he really embraced wholeheartedly and, and took a chance that he, you know, sort of went with. Yeah, indeed. I wondered if we might look at some of the details, because as you say, we, we, we don't know the exact identity of the man who is enjoying looking up the swinging woman's skirt. But do we know anything more about the figure who has, I think, certainly from my previous experience, emerged somewhat from the shadows, this more elderly figure who is sort of holding the rope and pushing the swing? Absolutely. I think this is a figure who, of the three, has emerged and surprised us more than any other element of the composition because we see now that this figure is clearly dressed in blue which indicates that it is likely not a clergyman as we you know as of course the the terms of the commission might have suggested and we also see that there are these beautiful shimmering touches um, that give more detail and texture to his costume and that maybe give an elegance to his suit that implies that he's not a servant, which of course is another option. Um, when I first saw the painting, I thought it might be a servant who was there to swing his mistress if it wasn't a bishop. And I think now that there's a sort of elegance and refinement to his costume that cuts against that interpretation. Also, of course, the fact that we can now clearly see that he's sitting down, which a servant would not have been able to do in the presence of his you know, so-called superiors. How interesting. Um, I wanted to also discuss whether it's possible that he can see the lying figure because he's, the lying figure is supposedly hidden in a bush. So are we to assume that the lying figure is indeed hidden from, from the, the view of the, the, of the figure pushing this way? That's an interesting question. And I think that one thing that Martin's treatment has really brought out is the role of the lying figure's arm 
um, his extended arm in the composition. We see that it is outstretched, you know, holding his hat. And I kind of thought that it was there to gesture him hailing this woman swinging towards him. But I think that as we started to uncover the painting in its entirety, we also realized that the arm is holding back bushes. And, you know, that he is, he is literally holding rose bushes away from him so that he can see her more clearly. But of course, that also implies that the bushes are obscuring him from the seated, more elderly figure. And of course, it's a picture of pleasure, right? So, uh, you know, the, the swooning face of, of the lying figure and that connection of their eyes. Are there any warnings in the painting? Is there anything to suggest that this is not this, this sort of stuff shouldn't be going on? Well, I definitely think that there's a sense of menace underlying that cleaning has also brought out because we can now see much more clearly that the rope that is holding her swing to the tree is starting to fray. And Martin was just pointing out last week, actually, that um, on the other side of the swing, we see ivy growing over the other rope, which, of course, implies both that the rope has been there for a long time, but also implies that the weight of the ivy will at some point overtake the rope and cause the swing to break. Um, There's also, of course, the statue of uh, Cupid in the left-hand side of the painting, and that's one that, you know, we've always known it it was there. It's uh, based upon a work called Menacing Cupid by a sculptor contemporary to Fragonard known as Falconet. And it was a famous work that was exhibited in the Salon in Fragonard's lifetime. And we knew that he was citing it. Um, But I think that now the statue has taken on a sort of greater presence. Um, It certainly dominates the left-hand side of the painting. And in comparing it with photos of the actual sculpture, we see that Fragonard has played with the proportions a little bit to make this this young um, so-called menacing Cupid larger. Martin, can you tell me something about what it's like to sort of reveal from beneath the varnish the true identity of this picture, the true colours? Well, you start off very, very slowly and cautiously with a tiny swab working under a microscope and see if the varnish is soluble, how much strength of solvent you need diluted to get it off, uh, trying various different places. I mean, the thinnest paint is the foliage at the top and some of the dark paint of the Cupid statue that Yuriko was just talking about. And then some of the foreground is very, very thinly painted. So uh, doing little tests uh, with, uh, with the microscope, you then progress to something a bit bigger and then clean something a little bit easier, which um, we decided to clean some of the bottom of the tree trunk. Um, first of all, to have a look at a few square inches. And um, after looking at it with Xavier and Yuriko, then we decided to go ahead and uh, slowly do the whole thing, photographing it at regular intervals. And of course, before cleaning started, so that um, everything could be checked all the time. And, but, it, but it must be wondrous to see that sort of extraordinary breadth of tones emerging from the painting from beneath this sort of discoloured varnish. Mm. Yes, it is, yeah. And it's also extraordinary to see how complex the handling of the paint is compared to any of the other Fragonards here, which are all beautifully painted in different ways. Uh, I mean, he was marvellous in the way that he could use all sorts of different styles and handling of paint and different sorts of paint, thick paint and thin paint and... Um, very dark paint in this case, um, very bright paint in some of the other paintings here. It's a great privilege to be able to do that. And of course, you take it very seriously. It's a dispassionate process. Right, I'm sure it is. an emotional one. (laughs) I'm sure it is. Tell me about that, because I'm I'm very interested in this idea that he would use different kinds of techniques. Does that sort of suggest that he obviously viewed this as a very prestigious commission and therefore took more care over it? Um, I think it probably does, as Yuriko suggested. Uh, It uh, must have taken much longer to paint, I think, and probably was painted in more stages than anything else here, or than most of his paintings at this time, some of which are painted incredibly quickly, and some, uh, like this, have been lingered over. But this, I think, is maybe the most extreme example of uh, a lingering painting. Can we tell us more about um, Fragonard, Yuriko? Because he's, he's an intriguing figure, because, of course, you know, the, the, his whole system of patronage disappeared at one point because he was very famous and then almost forgotten. That's true. He was, in his own time, I think, as I said at the beginning, tipped to become the leader of the French school. 
And I think there was a great deal of pressure on him for that reason. And then fairly early on in his career, in about 1767, when he made the swing, he really stepped away from that world and began to take on private commissions with subjects that were kind of specifically anti-narrative. So rather than making works that were trying to teach the viewer a lesson and to instill a sense of morality in his audiences, he was making works for private individuals that were all about pleasure, as with The Swing. And he continued in this vein until about the time of the French Revolution, at which point his, um, you know, the majority of his clientele, of course, was dispersed, either fled France or um, died at the hands of the guillotine. And I think for him, his landscape really changed, and he, in fact, basically stopped painting at that point. Um, after the revolution, he took up a post as curator at the Louvre Museum, and I think, you know, really stepped away from painting. Um, in the 19th century, uh, for most of the time, his work was essentially forgotten, because of the aesthetic shifts that happened with the revolution, I think there was a um, real disinclination to view painting such as the swing as you know really serious work. And um, it was only in about 1860 with the Rococo revival that his work has been celebrated anew. And tell us about his background in terms of painting, because he was in Chardin's studio, right, and in Boucher's studio. That's right. He studied with Chardin and then subsequently with uh, François Boucher, who was at that point, you know, the sort of great history painter, first painter to the king, professor at the Royal Academy, and a very much an establishment artist. And so by studying with an artist like that, Fragonard was really marking out his, you know, place as a successor in that kind of lineage. And I think that's something that's sort of important to remember about Boucher, because today we see him as quite a frivolous artist, but actually you know, at the time he was considered extremely serious and coming out of his studio meant a great deal. And that was another thing that Fragonard sort of stepped away from in taking on works like the Commission for the Swing. Martin, can you tell us something about the colour of the work? Because one of the things that is really striking is that, of course, the dominant colours in the painting when you're standing on one side of the room are green and pink. But the, I, I'm struck standing here right in front of the picture, that just the sheer variety of colour that he's using and, and, and this incredible facility with colour that, that we can see. Uh, yes, it is rather extraordinary, and it looks much more turquoise here than it did up in the room where I was working on it, actually. Uh, it looks deeper and richer here. Uh, he's used two different reds, a transparent red for the paler parts of the dress and a solid red for the darker parts of the dress and the seat of the swing, which is actually a very elaborate... Uh, thing with a sort of velvet cover and gilded wood below it. And then he's used all sorts of uh, greens and yellows and blues in the landscape and foliage, and the same two reds, or even a brighter red in the, in the roses at the bottom, particularly the bottom right, where the details are sort of spectacular. Indeed. I'm sorry we can't show it to everybody <laughs> under the microscope, but that can, in fact, be done later on. And then he's used uh, uh, black and white as well, of course, and... Um, painted with extraordinary deftness th throughout and a great deal of care. I mean, the, uh, the frieze of figures embracing on, uh, on the column below the, the cupid at the left is done almost sort of cheekily with um, highlights and are just a vague indication of their bodies, whereas some of the flowers and uh, the girl's face, there are lots of touches, far more than you realise looking at it, uh, hanging in the gallery. The blue is mainly Prussian blue, a pigment invented in the early 18th century, which was um, used by all the Venetian view painters, as well as by Fragonard. I think he used it in almost every picture that had blue in it. Uh, that is the, the dominating colour of the picture, apart from the girl and uh, the men's faces. Tell us about the amount of planning that went into it, though, because is it right that through studying the picture, you know, studying its history, as it were, you've been able to work out that actually a lot of it was improvised on the canvas rather than immaculately planned out? It's a little bit hard to uh, really pronounce on that. I mean, the two basic ways are taking an X-ray, which we have done, but because there's flake white in the ground, uh, the X-ray comes out almost uniformly white. And the infrared reflectography, which allows you to see any drawing in black under the paint to some extent, depending on how thick the paint is. We can see there is some drawing uh, under the cupid and uh, in the 
in the trees and branches in the top left and um, in the girl's left arm in particular. But for lots of it, we can't detect any drawing at all. But on the other hand, it's such a complicated thing. It would be hard, I think, to just paint it without any preparatory work at all, uh, without knowing what you were going to do. So are the lost drawings, are the, is there much more drawing than we can find with present techniques? We, we really don't know yet. Is there anything more we can find out about this, Eureka? I mean, do we know everything we can possibly know or is there, is there still stuff to learn? I think that we do hope to find out at least a bit more about the circumstances of the commission. I would, of course, love to find out the identity of the person who made the commission. And I also think that there is a certain amount that we can extrapolate based on the observations that we've been able to do thus far. I think that it's really by comparing this painting with other works by Fragonard and through close observation that we might be able to get a little bit closer to understanding the process by which he made the swing. But at the moment, one thing that we can say for sure is that he seems to have had with this work a very complicated process of going back in and making additional touches to the painting that I don't think either of us have seen with other works by Fragonard, where he does tend to be much more sort of a la prima, making works in one go, the sort of wet into wet technique. Here we're seeing something, um, as Martin said, a sort of more complicated layering process than I think either of us have experienced before with this artist, so I find that very interesting. And just a word on its redisplay because we're in the study here at the Wallace Collection and it looks resplendent. I hate this phrase but boy does this have wall power. Thank you. We're very excited with it in this new location. So we've moved the painting out of its traditional place in the oval drawing room into the so-called study where I think that the wall color which is predominantly pink does set off the very greenish bluish tonalities of the background of the painting and we have positioned it um, for the first time um, in my memory with our other seven paintings by Fragonard. When I started at the Wallace Collection a bit over three years ago, these eight paintings were dispersed across three galleries. Now they've been brought together into this one room, and I think that that will give our audience and our, our public a, a real sense of the sort of evolution of his career, some of the technical questions that we've addressed here with this idea of how the swing is differently painted than some of his other works. People can now experience that firsthand for themselves. And I think that it really presents a very strong view of this artist via our collection at the Wallace. Well, Martin and Yuriko, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, pleasure. Thank you so much. The Swing is at the Wallace Collection in London and admission is free. And that's all for this episode. Do subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With. There are new episodes coming later this month. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Lucia, Sherelle, Sandra, Yuriko and Martin. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.